Welcome back to the show. We got Ryan Callahan of 247 Sports to jump on here with us. Talk a little National Signing Day. I've got a couple of unrelated questions to ask you first, Ryan, and thank you for joining us. I know you're busy. Uh, yeah. Who is your favorite Christmas movie actor or actress? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Uh, you can think about it, and I can circle back at the end of the segment. You don't have to. I don't want to back you into a corner unnecessarily. Yeah, man. I, you know, I, favorite Christmas movie would be much easier, but, man, off the top of my head, just but maybe this is because I saw it just a couple years ago, and this would be a very unpopular pick. It might be Billy Bob Thornton from Bad Santa. Yes. <laughs> Great submission. Yes. See, this he, is why this really is why good. it's an important question to ask. It's an incredible movie. Yeah. It's a good, it's an underrated movie. It's not my favorite Christmas movie, but that performance is just so epic on, on his, uh, on his list of career movies. Uh, Ryan Callahan here with us on 104.5 The Zone. Uh, so Tennessee signed eight players among the top 200 recruits nationally, depending on where you look at these uh, composites. How would you describe the class as a whole now that we've had some time to kind of sit and think about it? Yeah, I, I think big picture, the, the gist of it is it's a good class that keeps, that keeps things on the, the same trajectory Tennessee's had for a couple of years now. You know, they, they were, they've been recruiting at a higher level since, since probably six months into the Josh Heupel era. I, I think you know, NIL has made things so competitive across the country. So there's you know, 25 programs out there capable of pulling elite players, and that used to not be the case. You know, we've seen Missouri winning big recruiting battles, uh, even Kentucky getting good players out of the transfer portal. It's, it's, it's tough out there for everybody. Uh, ask Florida fans. They're feeling pretty miserable today after what happened to them yesterday. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of programs not completely thrilled with their class, and a lot of programs uh, that, that used to not be competing for top classes are, are competitive, and that makes it tough. So I think the final ranking makes it look like just an okay class, but I think it's better than that ranking would suggest because the teams are all kind of tightly packed together. We've got the class calculator on 24-7 sports, and a couple days ago I plugged in Jordan Seaton to Tennessee's class, the five-star tackle, just to see what that would have done. At the time, it would have moved them from 14 to 8, one player. So that's how close the gap is between these teams. Just winning a couple of these battles that went against Tennessee would have probably vaulted them to seventh ahead of Auburn in the team rankings, and instead they're 13th. So I think you've got to keep in mind the transfer portal changes all this. Way easier to address needs post-signing day. And, and so, to me, the class is more about the top half, and the top half of Tennessee's class is really good. As you said, a lot of top 200 players, two five-stars, 11 five- and four-stars combined on 24-7 sports. It's a, a lot of good players, and they're going to help Tennessee over the next few years. The way Lucas just threw his head back in disgust or dismay, I'm not sure what the reaction was there just hearing about the Brad <laughs> Seaton thing, Ryan. He Brad? Who's Brad Seaton? Uh, excuse me. Uh, Jordan. Seaton. Jordan Seaton. Thank you. Brad Seaton. Brad Seaton is a former Villanova tackle that the Titans wow. drafted in the seventh round. Wow. <laughs> yeah, listen. <laughs> hey, hey, listen. Those there's journeymen stick with you, man. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough one when those are the ones that continue to stick in my, stick in my memory. I can't remember a yep. damn thing else. Ryan, but I remember Brad Seaton in the seventh round. Does that work for you, Ryan, with like a three-star signing from yeah. 2006 I, or something? I was I was just about to say that. I'll see a guy with an, like a name like Williams or something, and I'll trip over a name, and I'll call somebody by the wrong name. And when I do, I say, oh, my gosh, I just called him by a prospect from 2012. That's what right. am I doing? <laughs> That's right. I just, it's, good, it's good to know that sports brain, COVID brain is one thing, yep. sports brain another entirely. Ryan Callahan here with us of 247 Sports. He's been documenting all things Vols recruiting as well as keeping us up to date on the latest with the University of Tennessee. Um, So it's a smaller class than past years, as you mentioned, uh, but Tennessee, for people who may not be aware, is kind of limited on space. Yeah, they they are. Uh, that's not necessarily why the numbers ended up the way they they did, though. That that is something they have to take into consideration. I don't think they wanted to go twenty eight or twenty nine in this class because they are a little tight on space, and it, it's easier to manipulate the numbers now. You can you can pull a Deion Sanders if you want and just run off everybody to make room if you have to. Um, so it's you, you're no longer limited to twenty five signees per year and having to manipulate the signing class numbers the way they did for a few years. You can just sign however many you want. But that, I think they wanted closer to 25, ideally, because uh, they, they had a few guys they missed on. So the, the 21, I think, a little bit of a reflection of the missed battles. And even a couple down the stretch, you know, they were trying to fill some needs. 
missed out on Jaron Sensabaugh from Innsworth, who goes to Missouri on Tuesday. Uh, tried to get a second tight end in the class, made a late push for Kentucky commitment Willie Rodriguez. He ended up sticking with the Wildcats. So they end up one short at tight end. You know, didn't get a third receiver in this class. So, it, so the, the class numbers do reflect that they came up short at a few spots, mainly receiver, tight end, and corner. Um, a little bit short maybe on the D-line, too. But, again, all that's easy enough to patch up through the transfer portal these days that I don't, I don't dock the overall class, uh, the view of the class, too much just based on that. To me, it's more about the quality players they missed on, which were mostly back in the summer, but a couple in the fall, too, with guys like four-star athlete Cam Michael and Jordan Seaton, obviously, both picking Colorado over Tennessee. Those, were, th- those types of losses were more costly to me, but uh, they, there were a few positions where they came up a little bit short. So when you look at the big picture, Ryan, and building off of what you're saying, Tennessee obviously with the resources, the NIL, the sample size now of success on the field in the Hypel era, especially from 2022, feels like everything is there to recruit among the elite of college football. So what do you feel is the number one thing that's holding this team back from recruiting at that top five level, which they weren't able to do in this cycle, at least not as of now. Is it just that? Is it not being able to close in the margins on even just two or three guys that can make a massive difference? Well, for Tennessee, it would be really easy if there was one thing they needed to fix that they could just patch up and and move right on and start recruiting at a higher level. I think the the problem is nothing simple anymore. (laughs) NIL and everything else that's involved in recruiting these days has made it so hard, and all these coaches from all these different schools are, are trying to trying to guess and figure out what these kids are going to do. I mean, Colorado thought they had Jordan Seaton in the bag uh, two weeks ago, and now they're now they're worried he might flip to Maryland at the last minute. Uh, even when you win NIL battles, you you don't always win in the end. It's just um, sometimes the highest bid doesn't win in NIL uh, talks. It's just uh, it's amazing how complicated things are, and and you have to kind of try to read that picture and put it all together as coaches recruiting these players. Uh, it, it's not easy, and so I think Tennessee got bitten by a few things this year um, that, you know, sometimes sometimes not, not being the, the high bid and sometimes being the high bid and not and not, still not winning. So it's just different things with different players, and every recruitment really is different. But you, you have s- some things that they could do better. I think, you know, certainly relate, the relationship side, you can always do better at that. I think Tennessee's got to gotta get a little bit better in, in building relationships with some guys and making sure that they're – that they're involved uh, enough with players early in the process that they've got strong relationships and can, can make the cut and get official visits in the summer. The other thing, I think they've got to cast a little bit wider net at some positions. I think they didn't have quite enough realistic options at a couple spots going into the summer, and that's how they ended up short at, for instance, wide receiver, only signing two guys. The two they got were really good. Um, they just didn't get the three or four they probably could have used in this class because they, they just didn't have enough official visits from guys in the summer. Defensive line. They invested a lot in guys like Williams Winery and Kamarion Franklin that went elsewhere. And when those guys went elsewhere, they, they didn't have enough options left on the board. So got to cast a little bit wider net and make sure you have relationships with top targets and even second tier targets to where you, when you pivot, you're not going to guys that are way down your board. All right. So I'm, I'm looking at this from a neutral standpoint, Ryan, because I like when, when Tennessee fans probably hear you describe that it's just kind of a, a confluence of things to do with, I mean, I don't know if you want to call it bad timing necessarily, but something that's not helping Tennessee in its favor, how much more complicated recruiting is in name, image, and likeness with the transfer portal, with all the different things that basically hold hold these coaching staffs hostage at this time of year as they try and figure out who's going to be available for a bowl game or not. I, I kind of like that, even as a Tennessee fan, uh, I would be frustrated by that because I think it levels the playing field so much more. I love what it's become, even though I know that there are going to be some bad actors in this with with kids this young and the amount of money that's being tossed around and promises that are being made. And frankly, based on Florida last year, checks that are being bounced. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think the, the thing's still set up pretty well for Tennessee because, again, at the end of the day, they've got a good NIL collective. They've got a coaching staff that, that has stability for the first time in a long time. I mean, for how many years did we say Tennessee just needs some stability? Well, they finally have it. They've had hardly any coaching turnover, and when they do have turnover, they promote from within. Um, so they've got a very stable program. They've got a coaching staff that, for the most part, connects well with kids and has good relationships, and, and that, that plays well when, when especially NIL is often one of the more important factors. You don't have to have a staff full of ace recruiters these days because sometimes that doesn't matter as much, uh, quite frankly. So they, they've got a good setup for things. And, and like you said, it's, there's so much parity. I, I think what we're headed for, and I mentioned this on our podcast last night looking at the class, I just think we are headed toward a more NFL-like product in a few years where you're going to have 20 teams instead of 5 or 10 
capable of competing for championships on a yearly basis. The rosters are going to be much more similar. No one's going to be able to hoard depth the way Alabama and Georgia have in recent years. It's going to be hard to keep talented players in, in third team spots on the depth chart. That's going to lead to more even rosters, and it's going to come down to, like a lot of NFL games, who's got the best quarterback play. And that's set up well for Tennessee, too, because for the next, co- next couple of years, they've got Nico Iamaliava. If things fall their way, they might have George McIntyre from Brentwood Academy in a few years. So if you keep stocked the quarterback position and, and having a good offense like Josh Heifel has had for the most part, you're going to be competitive in this system where things are much more even across the board. Ryan Callahan at Ryan Callahan 247. The podcast that he just mentioned is the Go Vols 247 podcast available wherever you get your podcast. How is this staff doing with in-state recruiting? A little bit hit and miss, as I, as I mentioned in passing. They missed out on Jaron Sensabaugh Tuesday. Um, so that was you know not a devastating loss, but certainly a guy they wanted to add to the class. And there were a few other misses in-state. But when you look at the, the big picture, I, I think a pretty good in-state class. You've got Caleb Beasley, Edwin Spillman uh, from, from in, in Nashville right there. Uh, some other, other guys they really prioritize in the state, like Boot Carter, Marcus Gorey, teammates at Bradley Central down in Cleveland. Um, so they've got some really good players that are going to play a lot of football for them for the next few years. A couple guys that they obviously would have liked to have, Amari Jefferson, the four-star receiver from Baylor, going to Alabama. That was a, that was a tough loss at the end of the summer. Max LeBlanc, he's not originally from the state, originally from Canada, but he, he was in state at Baylor uh, going to Ohio State. That was a guy they pursued as well. Ronan O'Connell, the offensive lineman from Page, went to Clemson back in the summer, and then obviously sent the ball. So there were a few others they pursued and didn't get. So decent year in state, um, and just didn't get quite everybody they wanted. But that, that happens sometimes. This is such a transient state. It's such a competitive state now. It's going to be hard for Tennessee to lock down the state a lot of years. They do pretty well here. And this staff has put a lot of time and energy into it, though. So I think they're going to continue to recruit pretty well in the state of Tennessee. It's just, you know, not every year you're going to bat a 1,000 here. It can be difficult to gauge, you know, the stage of development that these kids are at when they arrive on campus. But just based on, you know, whether it's need or this staff's willingness to play young players at certain positions, Ryan, who comes to mind when you think of a true freshman in 2024 that might have the best chance to help this team? Yeah, it's a good good question, and you mentioned some key factors there that'll that'll just determine that. You know, we'll, we'll we'll see. I think a little more this year where they are willing to play young players and get those guys on the field early. Uh, I think just pure ability wise, it would be hard not to include Mike Matthews and Jordan Ross in that discussion. Uh, Mike Matthews, a five star receiver. I don't know that he's a day one starter, especially if Brew McCoy comes back. You know, they're still looking in in the transfer portal for wide receiver help. But I I'll be surprised if he doesn't play. He, he's a really talented guy, so I, I think he'll probably find his way out there in at least some situations, be a rotational guy as a freshman, if nothing else. And then Jordan Ross, to me, is just another talented edge rusher that they, you know, he could maybe grow into a strong side defensive end as well as a Leo on the edge. So they've, they, they've got some options with him, and we know Rodney Garner likes to rotate a lot of defensive linemen. So those, those two stand out to me as, as maybe the best bets. Uh, Peyton Lewis may be a dark horse as well at running back because that's an easier position to maybe get a, get a little bit of work here and there. So those three – and then the other guys are probably more, you know, we'll, we'll take some time. I really like this offensive line class, but that's a position where those guys are probably going to need a year or two to get on the field. And with Tennessee currently ranked 13th in the 24-7 sports composite, is there any opportunity for movement there as we move forward? And is there anything coming down the pipe that you would say to keep an eye on, any name or position, whether it's at the prep level or in the transfer portal? Yeah, they, they still are, and, and at least looking around at, at what's out there after after early signing day, we'll see if any other names pop up. The one we know of right now is a five-star that could sway things quite a bit if they could somehow pull this one off. But uh, Texas A&M defensive line commitment Dominic McKinley from Louisiana, they visited him last week in home. Uh, it sounds like they're scheduled to get an official visit from him next month. Uh, they, they were not a major contender for him until recently, so we'll, we'll see if, that, if they can kind of make a late comeback to get him. Uh, in, in January and down the stretch, but that's one where LSU, Texas, Texas A&M, and Oklahoma are all involved and have been for a while. So going to be a tough pull, but that's at least a five-star out there that Tennessee can make a, make a strong push for down the stretch. And uh, you know, we'll see if any other names pop up beyond that. They're definitely still involved in the transfer portal. You know, Tulane wide receiver Chris Brazel still out there. That I think they have a good shot at, and they've already gotten three guys in the portal. Still a few more needs to address there in addition to wide receiver. You know, they – they, they still would probably like to add another cornerback, maybe a defensive lineman, certainly an offensive lineman. So they're certainly not done with this roster going into next season. Ryan Callahan out here providing expertise for everybody on a regular basis, trying to keep us all up to date on the latest on what was a an interesting signing day, if not a, not that 
not that overwhelming, it seems, based on new information for Tennessee, things kind of falling to plan with a couple of misses there like he documented. Ryan Callahan, we appreciate the time, buddy. Thank you for it, and thank you for the work yesterday. I know you you got to be exhausted after days like that. Uh, it's it, it, not as bad as it used to be, but still still a busy day. But, but appreciate you having me, guys. At Ryan Callahan 247 is where you can follow him. I, oh, I meant to ask him if uh, – I meant to ask him if Joe Milton is starting the bowl game because he gives the Vols the best chance to win or because of some other, you know, emotional tie. I was going to try and experiment with some stuff here. Trying to carry over Titans conversations to the Vols. Well, two, you, you two, started it. Two birds, one stone. I mean, no, listen. I'm not judging. I, if I, Any way that I can find different ways to talk about a five-win football team, Lucas, I'm going to take it and run. <laughs> At that this is point. it's interesting what he said about Dominic McKinley, who did not sign with AM at the start of the early signing period. That would be a nice boost to this defensive line class. And the margins are so thin. What he said about you'd jump six spots with the signing of Jordan Seaton if that were to happen doesn't seem likely at all at this point. But the margins are just so thin in recruiting. And I think Tennessee, as he said, uh, kind of swung and missed on, on a few key guys. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is the number. If you want to join the conversation, we'd be happy to have you. There is also things happening in the FNM Bank chat that I do not want to acknowledge nor encourage, but you can participate there if you want to. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and on Twitch. Tune in to find out. <laughs> Elijah Molden is going to be on the radio show at twelve fifteen, uh, and you'll have Greg Cosell. Explain to you what he makes of this Titans coaching staff and their philosophical approach to offense. I think there's going to be some stuff in there that's enlightening, and if nothing else, you can hear it from Greg, so you don't have to hear it from me. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.